welcome 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 we are here for the language of story tongan and we are thrilled we are excited we are just can't wait to have questions answered but first we'll need to get some background first and our special guest is all the way in uh, Brigham Young University Hawaii and this is Tavita Okaili and he actually is a professor of anthropology and cultural sustainability he is also part of the faculty of culture language and performing arts and he he knows a thing or two about language of story and when it comes to Tongan and without further ado we will give that to him but just as a reminder to everyone you'll notice that we do have American Sign Language interpreters we actually have two of them from Five Star Interpreting and we're very grateful for that there will be moments when there will be slides that are shown and there won't be much speaking and that's because uh, sharing of slides usually interrupts the interpreting. So you'll see it just a little bit different, but don't worry, that's how it's going to be today. So without further ado, write in the YouTube chat there, write in uh, it, wherever you are, put your hands up in the air. If you're watching this as a recording later, you can still do this too. And we give you the time. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Rachel. It's an honor for me to be here and to participate uh in uh, this uh, important event um as you all know my topic is language of story in tongan um i am going to begin by uh just uh, uh recognizing acknowledging the places that we are uh, at i'm going to say something in tongan and this will allow you to to hear the tongan language uh, and then i will interpret uh what i i will say um, and this is a call a fakatapu, which is uh, recognizing the sacredness of, of a place. And here I'm recognizing the sacredness of Mother Earth. Um, and here we go. Tapu moe fonua, beamohono kakai tu fonua, tapu mono ngahi otua talume mua, kai ata peango fua e fanga, keu kau i hetala tala noa ki hetala oi fonua. The interpretation, I recognize the tapu or the sacredness of Mother Earth and its indigenous people. I also recognize the tapu or uh, otua, deified ancestors um, who have existed since the beginning of time and space. And I acknowledge these tapu so that I may be permitted or given permission to participate in the conversation today. And this is important uh, aspect of Tongan language where you always begin by acknowledging that places are, are sacred. And later on, I will talk a little bit about uh, the word tapu because we are English word taboo come from, from this particular word. Um, first, I wanna say uh, to talk to you a little bit about my, my positionality, uh, where, where I'm from, um, what have shaped me to this particular point. Um, as a as an individual. So I was born in Tonga, raised both in Tonga and the U.S., uh, mainly in uh, Salt Lake City and also in West Valley City. I am a native speaker of the Tongan language. I, uh, that was my first, first language. I grew up uh, speaking only Tongan until I was seven. And later I learned English uh, when I moved to the U.S. Um, I'm also a descendant of very important uh, deified ancestors, uh, Tangaloa, Maui, and Hina, these are their name, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about them. I also consider myself a diasporic or transnational Tongan anthropologist, meaning that I, I, I'm I, away from my homeland of Tonga, and I live in, in another place now, which is in Oahu, Hawaii, and I wanted to share a little bit about where I'm at. I'll, I'm going to go share a map here of uh, uh, just uh, where I'm at, and and then um, just to kind of show you that particular map. Okay, there we go. All right. So hopefully you can see. All right, hopefully you are able to see that. That uh, is, I'm in the north part of uh, Oahu, which is the uh, place called Kahuku. And that's where I'm at now. And it's all, all part of the of the Pacific. 
Now I'm going to show you a, a, a map to just to show you the history of the Tongan language. The Tongan language is part of a large uh, language group uh, called Austronesian language. And um, <clears throat> it started in Southeast Asia, in Taiwan, and it moved down to Tonga and to many other places. So I'm going to show you the that uh, slide now, and then uh, I will come back and talk about it. Okay, so as you can see in the slide, um, the Tongan uh, language was part of a large group of languages that started in Taiwan, came down to the um, Pacific, uh, especially a place called uh, Polynesia. And um, from there, uh, starting in Tonga, it moved from there to Tahiti, up to Hawaii, and then also to New Zealand, or where we call Aotearoa. That is the history of the language. So it began around perhaps uh, 5,000 years ago. And about 3,000 years ago, it reached Tonga and Samoa. Uh, it was there for about 2,000 years. And then from there, it started to move to Tahiti and other places. So that's just, just to give you a little history of this language and how long this language has been part of. Now, what I'm going to show you is a, a, a language tree. Uh, just to show you that uh, about 3,000 years ago, the language was all just one language. It was uh, most linguists refer to it as Proto-Polynesian language. Uh, and I'm calling it here in Moana Nui language. Moana Nui is just another word for uh, Polynesia, but it's the word in our in our indigenous language. Uh, Moana means deep ocean. Uh, maybe some of you have watched the Disney show Moana. Uh, which uh, is similar to, to that. So here I'm going to show you that, uh, that slide. Okay, so here we go. Um, so this is the one that we just saw. And then here is... All right, so you saw that that was the breakdown of language about 3000 years ago, it began as uh, one language, then it broke out to two language, the Tongic language, and also the proto nuclear uh, language. And from there, we have all branches of the language. So it's all very related language. So if you uh, have heard anyone speak Samoan or Hawaiian or Tahitian, these are all language tree and we have very, very similar words. Um, that you can uh, hear uh, if you, for just to give you an example, the, the word for a house is fale in Tongan, but it would be hale in, in Hawaiian. So you can hear the similarities in the, in, in, in the language, okay? Uh, the, the next slide I will show you is a slide about the migration, just to kind of show you the migration of the, of people from one place to another. So here we go. Uh, let's show you the slide here. So this is the migration. Um, there you go. Okay, hopefully you were able to see that. That's just to give you the, the time frame. And you, you also notice in that slide I showed that uh, people went all the way to, um, coming from Southeast Asia, went all the way to America. So this is a, what the, have shown in many of the studies that uh, most of the people have, because they were voyagers, they were able to voyage all the way to, to America. And this is where we mostly receive uh, sweet potato, or we call kumala. Uh, in this particular uh, voyage. Just to give you a sense of how big this uh, area is, uh, I think it's probably three times the United States. Uh, just the, this area that we're calling um, Polynesia or Moana Nui, uh, this area is, is, a, is a big, um, um, huge area. 
Okay, now what I'm going to do now is I want to show you just uh, some of the words that have come from the Tongan language and now has been adopted into the English language uh, because uh, we have our contribution to the to the English language just to kind of give you a sense of that before I go into to tell you a little bit about um, um, our story. So the first one is that the word um, tapu, which I started my presentation, um, this is where we get the English word taboo. So the English word taboo is actually a Tongan word um, that came into the English uh, language. So every time you hear somebody use the word taboo, this is a Tongan word. Uh, and it basically uh, meant sacred, uh, something that is restricted or prohibited because of its sacredness. Uh, so this is where this particular word. Another word is tattoo. So tattoo comes from the Tongan word uh, Tatao, ta tatao. Um, and when the uh, early explorers came to Tonga, uh, they saw many of the people from Tonga and Samoa and Tahiti and Hawaii, they had tattoos. So um, they had to learn the words. And so they use this word. And this is where we get the English word tattoo. So taboo and tattoo, these are two Tongan words uh, that uh, we have. Now, now to talk about stories and oral storytelling. Uh, there are many words in the Tonga language about uh, stories. Uh, one is called Tala Oi Fonua, or the sacred stories of the Fonua or the land. Um, and most of these stories have to do with the ecology, our relationship with the ecology. Um, and some have stories that are involved uh, origin stories, how the world came about, the beginning of the islands. Uh, we call these words, uh, this talatupua or origin stories. We also have tales that are called fananga. Uh, we have many songs. The songs are also another way that we use um, to tell stories. Um, and even in stories, when we tell a story, there would be singing in the story as part of uh, the story, almost like chanting in a, in a way. So we have both storytelling, but also uh, singing in, within a, a particular story. Um, and then I would say that storytelling is part of our uh, genre of art. So we have three main art forms. Uh, one is Fiva, with is performance art, and this is where storytelling is part of. Uh, we also have another one called uh, Tufunga, material art, and then Nima Mea, which is fine art. These are the three main sort of art form. Now, because Tongan was mainly an oral uh, language, um, we do have uh, many of our early uh, stories. They were uh, encoded in, in many of our symbols. Uh, and they are usually encoded in tapa cloth. So I'm going to show you just an example of a tapa cloth and uh, a symbol that's there. What you're going to see is a symbol of, a, of two birds. Um, so the stories are, are embedded within or, or, or encoded in these, in, these, uh, in these symbols. So I'll show you the symbols here. Okay, um, here we go. Go. So we've seen this. Okay, here we go. Yeah. All right. Two, here we go. <clears throat> so what you saw there were um, a way of writing, sort of our way of writing, but in more pictures pictorial representation of it. Um, so you've seen tapa uh, in maybe in different occasion, or you'll see people, uh, uh, you know, bring it out in different occasions. But in the tapa, there are all these symbols that are in it. Now, these symbols are in the tapa. You see people tattooing. Some people refer to them as tribal tattoo. Um, you'll see it in many other forms but it's actually a way of representing the story. So here's, a, we have a lot of stories about birds and the one that you just saw was the symbol for, for those uh, birds. Um, I'll show you another, just to give you another example uh, of, of this. Um, let's see, let me see if I can get this one up here. 
Um, yeah, I know. So this is the one we just saw. Okay, if you notice that one, that was a fish. That's a trick of uh, trick of fish called humu. We have a story about that. And so the story uh, uh, about this one is a uh, is two twins who actually took the humu fish up to the sky, and it now lives up in the Milky Way. But you can see the shape here. First, the sh the shape of the fish is then put into a sort of lashing shape. Uh, which is well, houses were lashed in that way. And then you can see it uh, when it's finally up in the top. I'll, I, I think I'll sh show it one more time just to, so you can see the see it. Okay. So before we had written language, many of our stories were in symbols. Uh, and those symbols were were painted in our uh, tapa cloth. And that was one way to actually tell the story or to uh, represent and present um, the, the story. Um, in the stories, many of our characters had names. Uh, the names were important because the names would tell you a little bit about the character of the uh, of the individual. Uh, so you'll have a name, and the name will hint at that particular uh, person. Um, so that's one other element that's important. Another one is that many of our stories use metaphoric language. We call them heliaki. So basically, you use symbols to tell a story about uh, something that is very important. So I'll just give you an, a, a quick example. Um, there's a lot of uh, stories about someone went to go fishing and when they they would fish up islands they use they use a fish hook and this fish hook would be what they would use to fish up an island and um there's a whole story about this um deity named maui who would go out and fish up the islands and we call this uh fish hook matau fusfonua or uh land fishing hook but actually what it's referring to it's referring to a particular constellation and it's much more poetic to say that you went out and fish up an island than to say that you went and discover the island. Um, and what is also amazing about this is that the fish hook is a constellation of stars that are called Scorpio in English, but it looks like a fish hook from a Tongan perspective. So I'm going to show you that uh, particular uh, slide here. So here is the last one we saw. Okay, and then um, let's see, here we go. Okay, hopefully you were able to see that. So what, what the story is actually telling you is that the person who went to discover the islands used the constellation Scorpio, which looks like a fish hook, and fished up the island. So the story would say that there was this person who went out and discovered new islands, but would say went out and fish and basically fished up the island. So this is the poetic language uh, or the Heliaki language that are used to tell the, the story of a, of a particular place. Now, these stories are important because most Tongans are descendants of the deities uh, that are in these stories. Uh, for example, the story I just told you uh, is uh, a story from Maui. Uh, many people are already refer, uh, familiar with Maui from from Disney's Moana, um, but Maui is a is a one of, is my thirty sixth great grandfather, and he's very important because he fished up islands, he uh, he created new plants and 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 um, new trees. He would raise the sky. So this is such an important important figure. In, in our in our tradition. Um, and what I, I want to say about this is that most of the stories that uh, Tongans tell are family history. Um, but the, because they are descendants of the people that they're telling stories about, a lot of these stories again are in, in uh, symbolic language. 
they are in the Heliaki language. So oftentimes people will say, oh, these are just mythology or these are, you know, just made up stories, but they're actually real stories, but they're told in poetic language, such as, you know, someone went out fishing and fished up an island, which basically means they discover uh, a new island. Um, now, I want to just kind of, you know, I'll show you a, just a little bit of uh, this one so you can see. Uh, first, I'm going to go back so you just see the fish hook again, and then we'll we'll, we'll show you um, Maui. Fish hook. So that was just a, a rep representation of Maui. Um, this important story about the, the person who went out to do fishing and, uh, and used the scorpion, uh, Scorpio constellation to fish up there. Now, another story that is told uh, often in our tradition is a story about uh, birds. We have a lot of bird stories. And it would basically say that our ancestors came in the form of a bird to discover an island, which is a very similar things that you can see that oftentimes when a new island is formed, the first things that actually arrives in the islands are birds. So we have uh, stories about these birds and I'll just show you one uh, picture of, of that. Uh, here we go, just to first I'll, I'll show you the, the Maui picture and then we'll see the story. So that was a, a Pacific golden plover bird. And we have lots of story about that particular bird. We we call it a kiu. Um, basically, when a new island is formed, this is usually the bird that shows up first. When a new island is formed from a vo volcano, a volcanic eruption, then you'll see uh, plants will grow, and then the first things you'll see are birds. So even though those stories would say that um, ancestors came in the form of a bird to settle that particular island, it's basically telling us the story about, you know, this is how the islands was, um, was formed. Um, we also have stories about uh, women who were so significant in our culture in the beginning, um, especially when it comes to relates to the moon, uh, we call it Mahina. And um, the name for, the, for, for this uh, particular individual is Hina. So you can see that the name is in this um, particular uh, individual. What I'm gonna show you are uh, just three different images. And the three images tells you about this in individual. This is, uh, it's also um, I'm a direct descendant of, of Hina, which is my 36th great grandmother. So we're, we're talking about thousands of years going back. But this is associated with the moon. She's associated with creating of our calendar. And she's also associated with shark. Uh, because Tonga is a, a, an island in the ocean, uh, fish, whales, Shark, they're so important. And they are referred to as ancestors. They're referred to as relatives. Um, we we actually are not afraid of shark. Uh, sharks are pet to us. So when people are running away and they uh, don't want to be around sharks, we love to be around shark. We serenade and uh, tell stories about shark. And one of the shark goddess is Hina. And Hina is an important individual. She's a goddess. And I, I'm going to show you the next few images will be just about that. And then I'll come back and, and just tell you a, a little bit more about that. So here we go. We'll show you the image of the bird and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So this your image. Okay, so what I just showed you um, is that our uh, 
uh, Hina uh, is a important goddess in Tongan tradition. Um, she is basically the creator of our moon calendar. Moon faces are associated with her, but also with shark. Uh, the story is that uh, she uh, became a shark and that the shark are, are important for our ecology, but also important for us. And because many of us are also descendant from her, um, we see ourselves as related to shark. Now, this is a poetic, beautiful language. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're directly related and descend from shark, but it means that we had ancestors who were so close to the ocean and close to shark that they um, uh, see that as, as relative. Right, I see it as relative. And in, in the Tongan language, again, Hina is an important, uh, this is the name of this individual, this deity. And then the moon is also called Mahina. So you can see that the, the name of the deity is also the name of the moon. And so you can see the importance of moon in the way that um, it, is, it is told. Okay, one more story, and then I'll, I will, hopefully we'll get some time here for you to, to, to uh, ask questions. So what I'm gonna show you here is another important um, deity, a goddess for us. Her name is Hikuleo. And she was uh, an individual who could be male or female, kind of gender fluid, could move from male to, to female and female to male. Uh, she's probably our most important uh, deity to us um, because uh, fertility, uh, agriculture, everything that had to do with growing was associated with this particular deity. And she would often come in the form of a bird, or um, again, going back to the symbol birds that we were talking up before in the early. So I will show you uh, um, two images from that, just to kind of show you this image. And we'll let me show you again, this is the, so this is the last image of here. Okay, I may, maybe I went too fast on some of those and there are a lot of texts, but I just wanted to sh show you um, Hikuleo as an important deity um, who comes in those particular, a form of a bird called the kingfisher. Uh, and so we see ourselves as related to this particular bird. I would say this is a kind of another poetic heliaki form to show that uh, this individual Hikuleo probably came from a place where this bird, there was a lot of these particular birds. So people will tell the story as though she was the bird. Uh, but it also tells us that we have a responsibility of caring for these um, important um, birds or things that are in the environment that are important. So again, lots of our story have to do with things in, in nature, things in the environment that, that are important. Um, the last two slides that I wanna show you is that um, over the years, because a lot of Tongans now live outside of Tonga, um, there are more Tongans outside of Tonga than in Tonga. So there's about 100,000 Tongans in Tonga, but there are about 200, 250,000 Tongans that live in New Zealand, Australia, and in the United States. Uh, in Utah, there's a big population in California. There's a big population and also in Hawaii. So recently, oh, maybe two, three years ago, I started writing children's book or helped to translate some of these stories into Tongan just to, to share the importance of make, make, making sure that the stories are told. And these books are bilingual. So they're both English and in Tongan. So the reason why I keep it in the Tongan language, because again, some of the words of the name of the characters or even the, the symbolism they are more, uh, you can see the depth of it more in the Tongan language, and then you can, of course, translate it into English. So one of the ones that I uh, first uh, been writing was one about the, the cosmogony, which is the creation story. So we have our own creation stories with gods and goddesses who were involved in the creation stories, um, partly because many of the children who now live outside of Tonga are not familiar with these stories. 
Uh, they're familiar with, uh, of course, the Judeo-Christian creation story of Adam and Eve, but many are not familiar with this uh, story. So I've uh, written this book. So I'll just show you an image uh, of, of that. And then, um, hopefully that, okay, well, so first I'll, I'll, I'll show you the last image of the Kingfisher. So um, those are the books, two books, and there's some other books that I have been working on to try to um, teach uh, some of these stories to the uh, younger generation, especially the ones that are in elementary school and so forth. And the, what I really like about these stories is the stories tell you about your responsibility to care for the environment, because a lot of the story tells about how our relatives are birds, or they are fish, or they are plants, and so forth. So it's beautiful to have these particular um, stories to tell, both in the Tongan language, but also in English. And so uh, those who may not speak English, uh, they can uh, speak Tongans, can learn it in English, and it also helped them to learn um, the, the Tongan language. So with that, I think I will close with that, but to, I, hopefully you'll have some questions that you want to ask me about some of the, uh, the Tongan language and then just the stories uh, about uh, Tongan. Uh, with that, uh, thank you. Malo a pito. So glad to have all that wonderful information and such beautiful visuals too uh, with that. I think that really worked to be able to have uh, your experience combined with those images there. And let's in the in the stream as well as here, I'm gonna do it right here, is uh, show our appreciation so much. Now this is the part where we get to ask questions. So in the stream, make sure that you uh, write those questions. And to kick us off, uh, I mean, you're talking about 36 or 37th when it comes to with ancestry. And I know that you said that the Tongan language, it was only a couple hundred years ago before it start, you know, got gotten written down. So the fact that you know those stories and you know those connections, tell me a little bit more about how your family or how others can even remember those kinds of things. Yeah. So each family had somebody who was a, this uh, designated as a genealogist. That, that would be their responsibility to remember all the lines going back 40, 50 generations. Um, so it was usually the eldest female in the family. So the eldest daughter would be the responsibility to remember. Uh, in some of the uh, cultures within Wananui or Polynesia, uh, they would put it in a chant form. So it would be in a song. And you could sing it in in in, in, a, in a chant. Uh, some of these chant would have like two thousand lines in the chant, so you have to remember the full songs in order to remember all the names of your ancestors. Yes, and so when when the missionaries came, uh, people started to write down a lot of these chant, or they would write down the the, the ancestors. And that's why we we have them in written form. But before that, it was all uh, oral. Uh, tradition and and memorization. Um, so that's how 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 we, we remember. And if you if you some genealogists will use a, a way of sort of kind of using 30, 25 to 30 years per generation. So if you use that to figure like 36 or maybe 40 generations, we're talking about about a thousand years back of genealogy. Yeah. Wow. I mean that's that's just amazing. All right, we do have a question um, from the stream here, and mm -hmm. I, I did put in the chat to give you a heads up, but the question is, what are some themes found in the traditional Tongan stories? All right, thank you. Well, one that I already mentioned, uh, because a lot of stories uh, tells you that you're related to animals or birds or fishes, uh, the, some of the, many of the themes is about making sure you care for these because these are relatives, right? So re your relatives are not just humans, 
but there are also these entities within the environment. So that's one particular theme that uh, that is there in the story. The other themes have to do with living within a communal, being collective, sharing, um, reciprocity, uh, and and so forth. Um, so the Tongan culture, like many other Moananui or Polynesian cultures, are live in village, and so sharing, caring for for the members of the community is important. Um, so, in uh, being an individual or trying to do it all by yourself is not really highly uh, <laughs> emphasized. Uh, you work together as a community. And I think this really works out for a culture that had to uh, voyage for long distant voyaging. In a long distant voyage and you're in a double haul canoe for months, you have to learn to get along with each other and you got to learn to share your, your resources and your provision with one another in order to survive the long voyage. So those are important themes that are that are in it. Okay, great. Um, the next question um, is actually, uh, besides the stories that you've published, what are the best ways to find published Tongan stories or resources? Uh, there are ones online. You can you can Google many of these stories, uh, but they're 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 much more difficult to 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 get. Most stories are still in printed form. Yeah, so uh, the one that I show you are published by Tweenies. Tweenies, uh, so if you if you go online and, and search for Tweenies, uh, you'll see it. But there are other people who also have books out there on, on Tongan stories. Um, and, and you can you can get them um, online. And there are some that uh, you know you can uh, get a you know just a PDF version of it and 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 so forth. Oh, there are also videos. Some people have made videos uh, of, of uh, this, these stories, not, uh, you know, like a podcast and so forth that they would tell the, the stories. Um, there are very few animation um, or, or even, um, you know, other kinds of forms. So hopefully we'll have more in the future. Wonderful. Well, we have another question uh, from the stream. We have, is there a trickster character in the culture? And if so, tell us more. If not, tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do have trickster. In uh, fact, Maui is a trickster. Uh, uh, remember, I said Maui is my 36th great grandfather. Yes. So Maui is a trickster. And in, 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 in fact, as a trickster, Maui would um, sort of trick the other gods so that they will share uh, knowledge with with the rest of the of the world. Uh, for example, um, how we got fire. Uh, the, the one of the story is that the fire was only possessed by the you know the chief or the 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 elite gods of society, and Maui would went and, and trick them and actually smuggle fire out from them and then share it widely with everyone. Um, so, so Maui is a trickster character, and as you know, uh, most trickster character are, you know, we, we're not sure if they're good or they're bad, they're sort of kind of in between, but oftentimes they do really wonderful things for society. They, 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 they sort of challenge the status quo, challenge the norm, and say, hey, you know what, I think we should do things. I think fire should be shared with everyone so everyone can have cooked food. It should be only for certain people, right? And so I really like trickster character, uh, even though they're sort of kind of gray in 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 in, uh, in mythology or in stories. So Maui is definitely one of the the trickster sto uh, character in in Tong and stories. Yeah. Well, a follow up with that because you know Maui being well well demigod, but is yes. there a, what about? Is there an animal that also represents on the trickster side of things, just as a follow-up to that? Yeah, so Maui is a shapeshifter. So Maui can shift into a, a, a bird. It can shift into different kinds of animals. So what we have is that Maui is a human. That's the human form. But it can come in a, in a bird form, and it can also come in a fish form. Uh, or even other other forms. So that's the the the, the way to to think about it. Yeah. 
So then to ask on top of that is, does Maui have a favorite animal to turn into that maybe is more that trickster side of him? Uh, different birds. Actually, there's not one particular bird. The different birds, like uh, there are some stories where Maui turns into a chicken. Uh, there are stories that Maui would turn into a dove. So there hasn't actually not really a, any particular fa uh, favorite one. I think there are multiple uh, animals that Maui, usually a bird, I would say a bird would be the probably the, 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 the one that Maui would turn into. Yeah. I, just, I figured that Maui would just have a favorite. I mean, continue <laughs> anything, but come, you know, yeah. it has to be a favorite. Now we do have a next question from the stream and um, it's there in the chat if you need to see it. Since yes, I see many it. of these stories are linked to genealogies. What is the view of the Tongan people on non-Tongan storytellers telling these stories? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we are very open to non-Tongan telling this, the stories. Uh, we're happy for others to share these stories. Um, I think uh, one, one way to, to, as long as people give credit and acknowledge where the story comes from, um, I think that's one way to, to do it. I often uh, advise people to do it in a collaborative manner. For example, if you want to do a Tongan story, you can collaborate with a Tongan and work together on the story. Because what I like about that particular way of doing it is that two individuals coming from two different cultures, they have skills uh, that they can work together to bring the stories out. Uh, for example, you know, the Tongan individual may have knowledge of the story, but the other individual may have knowledge of filmmaking or knowledge of other skills and the, and just the combination of the two, I would say that that would be the way to, to go about. Um, I, I know that there are some people who worry about like cultural appropriation and so forth. That's why I think collaboration is the way to, to go about uh, sharing some of these stories. I, I love that. I, I, I can just imagine it already. And also uh, we have a question here and I'd like it to be a kind of a twist um, to it. And this is the question. What are unique markers, if any, for Tongan stories? So I know we've already covered themes, but let's, you know, are there unique markers? Are there um, like, like, oh, you can tell, or you have a hint if you hear this story or a snippet like that, I think it probably has Tongan roots or something. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any particular unique markers. Uh, there are singing in Tongan stories. I, I don't know if that would be a unique marker. So, so <laughs> part of that could be, so in, in a lot of Tongan stories, you would tell the story, but then there would be part where the character is singing uh, in, in, in the, in, or chanting. Uh, they will chant. So I, I, that's one, one particular marker. And then another marker would be that uh, the name of the character uh, usually is a hint to, to the, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, attribute of that particular character. I, I don't know if those are unique. I think you find this in other stories, but that's maybe one way to to think about, uh, you know, some of some of these stories. Yeah. So just to give you an example, Hina, the the female uh, goddess that is associated with the moon and the shark and so forth. Hina is actually also the word for something that is bright um, or even uh, white. So you can see that Hina is associated with, with the moon as something that is bright and also white uh, and so forth. So you can already tell that the story of Hina is gonna have to do with something about that uh, element. So I guess that's a, a little bit of a example, yeah. Okay, the person asking that question actually has a, a follow-up to it or maybe okay. to uh, explore it a little bit more. And I'm gonna put that in there. So perhaps there is a cadence, mm. rhythm, signature words, you know, like maybe um, openings that are traditional or closing when you end a story that are traditional. Um, and and the person really appreciates your your thoughts on this. Yes. So in, in the story, there would be uh, the audience would engage in a clapping. Uh, so but just to give you an example, the person would uh, tell the, the story and they would say tupa and then everyone would clap uh, as a way of sort of kind of making sure that your audience is awake and that they're engaged and that they're involved. And they will tell the story and then it will say tupa and everyone will 
clap. So this is sort of a cadence, a rhythm that is part of, um, of the story. And then usually at the end, the storyteller would be, will end the story by saying, and this is the end of the story. And then I return back to my village. So there's sort of kind of, you, the, the storyteller will tell the story and take you to, and then at the end, the storyteller will end by saying, and now it's the end of the story. And now I'm returning back to my home village as a way of ending um, uh, the, the story. Oh, that's really beautiful. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and with the clapping that has that call and response, you know, yes. there's other cultures that that use that same technique of, are you with me? You know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it is the, definitely a call and response um, particular uh, element of it. Um, and, and even in, in many of the stories, when they are doing the singing or the chanting, people will be involved in, in the singing and the, and the chanting also uh, in the story. And could you spell tupa? Like that's what is said. Yes. But what is that? Uh, tupa just means to sort of uh, clap, which is T-U-P-A. Uh, T-U-P-A. So yeah. T-U-P-A. T-U-P-A. Okay. Yeah, T-U-P as in Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, A. Tupa. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the actual Tongan language is pretty easy to, to spell because it's uh, similar to Spanish. Um, I -E -O -O. So you you always have a uh, you know but lots of vowels in it, but they're all pronounced similar to the to the Spanish uh, vowels. Okay, great. Well, I'm also um, thinking about you talked about song. I mean, what uh, is there um, like on the low side or a high side a pitched for that, or is it kind of a mixture? Um, I guess I want to understand a little bit more of when yeah, you the songs are often in minor, minor sound. I don't know if, if that makes sense to people. And it's a very sort of soothing um, uh, uh, singing. Um, uh, part of it is that um, I think most of our stories come from a place that we refer to as sort of the spiritual place. So um, the, the song are in that particular uh, form. So they're not like exciting sort of kind of songs. They're, they're more, may, more, more kind of chanting sort of, 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 of music in, mm. in, this, in, this, in the songs, yeah. Well, and, and song typically connects to dance. Um, yeah. Can you tell us more about dance and any connection to, uh, to story? Yeah, so if you tell the story in a dance, uh, there's a, a different um, sound to, to those particular stories that are in the, in the dance. But mo many of our dances are uh, done in a communal form. So there are several dancers that are dancing. And the hand movements are basically um, uh, representation of the, of the story. So they're, they're like sign language. So in sign language where you use... Um, sign to represent the words in Tongan dances you use dance movement to represent the 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 story so you would have a sign for bird you would have a sign for moon you would have a sign for shark you would have a sign for you know whatever the story is uh, and and those are particular choreography uh, movements that are used in the dance yeah Okay, wow, I, I love all of this. Uh, we do have another question from the stream. Yeah. Uh, it is, uh, you mentioned before that there is singing and telling. Do you also do string, uh, do you also do string game storytelling like some other islands in Polynesia? Uh, yes, there are uh, places, not so much in Tonga, but there are other places in Polynesia that do string uh, game uh, storytelling. Uh, most of oh, our, and, our and also, do you yeah. mind explaining string game? Because some some people may not understand what that is too. So, can you also explain that? In so you would use strings to represent. So one way to do it is uh, there would be strings that would be used to form uh, a shape of a constellation. That would be one way. So you know how people would use strings with their hands to to make patterns. Uh, there are people who would do uh, strings to show you a constellation like the Orion can be formed in a particular strings. Uh, it's too bad I don't have a 
picture here. It would be better to show you in the picture. But you can Google this online. You'll see the, the, the different strings that are used to create. Um, and, and so we do have some of that, but not as much as maybe other uh, groups within uh, Polynesia that, that use uh, that. Uh, there are also uh, some that would use knots. Um, so they would use a rope and they would have knots in there to sort of remind them of the genealogy. So each knot represent an individual. There are carvings that uh, also would carve each ancestor so that when you're telling the story, when you when you touch the first carving that reminds you the first ancestor, you move your hand down throughout all the different ancestors. So there are many different kinds of uh, ways that storytellers would use to, re to remind them of what the story is about. Um, and then of course, another way is that when you tell the story in the place where the story took place, you could point to the rock and say, this is the rock as part of the story. Uh, for example, the individual at the end turned into a, a stone and here's the stone, you can see it right here, right? So there are many other ways that people would use before written words came uh, to help them uh, remember the story. Okay, and actually this follows up on what you're just talking about. Yeah. Um, so what are those memorization techniques, which you are already expressing some, yeah. um, which way do you prefer to use in memorizing? So if there's any other memorization that you could expand upon, and then for you personally, what do you like to do when, when remembering? I like putting it in song form. I think it's easier to put a story into a song because it's easier to remember it that way. And then once you get the tune and so forth, um, that's the best way. And it's just fun to, to, to do it in songs. Um, you know, a lot of teachers do this, right? When they're teaching students about numbers and so forth, or teaching them the alphabet. Um, and we have a lot of this, this is a particular way that Tongans used to remember. That would be my favorite one. And then the, the second one are the symbols that you saw in the tapa. I like seeing the symbols because the symbols are like a, pictorial representation that's easy to see and you could just point to the you know symbol of the bird and tell the story that way yeah mm. I've, I've seen storytellers have uh, coats or uh, wardrobes of some kind that have different symbols and people can point and then have that story told is there something similar that is like a cultural thing of of like that we so the, the the cost not during storytelling, but when you are dancing, uh, if you've ever seen any um, of the Tongan dancing, you'll see that many of them will wear a uh, lot of flowers and leaves and so forth. Now each one of those do tell a story because they they basically tell the story of where the person is from. These are flowers from their village. These are plants or leaves from their village and so forth. That, so that's one one thing that people do. Um, but uh, I, I can't really think of storytellers using any of the stuff that you're referring to. Yeah. Well, and, and those plants and that connection, it, it makes me think of the closing line that is often used about returning back to the village and here mm -hmm. you are wearing plants of your village. There's that circle that is exactly. uh, really beautiful. I, well, you said it's poetic. I, it's definitely <laughs> po poetic. Indeed. And, and then also ecological in the sense that, um, you know, the plants from your village, uh, you know, the flowers from your village, you are one with them. So caring for them is important, right? Making sure that these plants continue to live on because um, you and those plants are one. You are the village and the village is you and so forth, right? Right. Yeah. Well, and so someone's asking, do you have tapa as a kind of background that is next to the storyteller? And we can expand that question also. Does a storyteller ever use um props or certain things to to enhance certain parts of it but, yeah the top top for, for yeah. definitely is used um, because people are, are are either sitting on the top or they're sitting on a mat when the story are told so you're actually sitting on the visual aid so that the storyteller can actually paint point to the you're sitting on the symbol of the bird or the shark or so forth so that's one way to to tell the, the, the story or people would be wearing them. So tapa was actually used as a, I guess this answers your other question that you asked before because uh, because now 
very people do not wear tapa, but tapa was the what clothing were made of before. So in early ancient times, I would have to say the symbols would already people would wear them. And then the probably the one that is permanent is tattooing because you walk around with the tattoo already tattoo on your shoulder or your hand and those symbols are already there. So as a storyteller, you can just show the tattoo that you have and say, these are the birds that I was talking about and you can see it on my tattoo here. Yeah. I love that the listeners could be sitting upon the symbols of these stories almost as a way of um, absorbing them in some way. Is, is yeah. that was what was meant or I wonder how that came to be? I yes. Guess. I, 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 that is what it was meant to be because when, when you don't have a written language, you, you write your stories and everything that you have in the mats that you are sitting on and the tapa that you use for clothing or also blankets. And then if you remember, I showed you a symbol of the fish, uh, the homo fish, it was a lashing. So our houses were not nailed together. They were lashed together. But the lashing had symbols. So if you remember, I show you the symbol of the fish in the lashing. So while you're sitting in the house, you can just look up to the lashing and say, there is the symbol of the humu fish that we were talking about. So it's everywhere, like in the house. It's, it's, a, it's basically embedded in everything. In, um, and, and, and that's a little bit different from, you know, having a book or, you know, and, and so forth. Hopefully that helped. Yeah. Oh, of course. So you're wrapped in story. This is yeah. so beautiful. And I'm, I'm looking at the time and I, it looks like <laughs> it's that, that time to wrap up. But uh, is there a question that we didn't ask that you were hoping we would ask? This is your chance to answer. <laughs> well, here, here is what uh, uh, all the stories uh, is the way that history were preserved, but also scientific knowledge. Uh, so we had our own science. Uh, and our science were in our stories, but the stories were always told in a very poetic form. Uh, so science and humanities uh, or science and stories were considered one single knowledge form. They weren't separated. Uh, you know, sometimes when you go to school, you say, well, I got to go do science and then I got to do you know, the other humanities such as art and so forth, but art and science, at least in the Tongan way of conceptualizing it, were just one knowledge system. Um, and I hope, hopefully that was something that um, I was able to convey to you about that. I think that was just one last thing that I'd like to share. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, this has been just remarkable. Uh, people there in the stream, and, and if you're watching this later, just uh, put your hands in the air at this moment. Doesn't, doesn't matter who's around, just, just show your appreciation. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Tavita Okali'i. Uh, we are just thrilled with this opening of eyes and minds and everything. I'm sure all of us are gonna want to explore um, even more. The good news is, everyone, is that the slides, uh, we will, uh, after the stream ends, add in the description of the stream so you can access it later with the slides. So if you wanted to study them a little bit closer, uh, thank you for being understanding everyone because American Sign Language, we wanted to try to balance things a little bit there. And also we love your feedback. We do get grants to have this even possible. So um, already in the stream, I placed in there with the feedback form, but another place that you can go to real easy is storycrossroads.org. Uh, and then you, you do slash one dash stop. And that actually is not just the feedback form, which is at the very top, but it also has a, a popular um, sites for us because besides this event, we do things year round. We want to give thanks to our funders. There's so many of them and we have continuous funders, which is really exciting. So for example, the American Sign Language, how we could even do that, that's thanks to the National Endowment for Humanities and Utah Humanities. So a special attention to that, but also when it comes to, in general, we have the National Endowment for the Arts, the Western States Arts Federation. We have the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Utah Legislature, we have the Salt Lake City Arts Council, and we also have uh, just so just so much 
from individuals like you. So thank you to all of you. Again, it's been wonderful. Enjoy your day, explore more. And, and just like with the language of story, Tongan, just you're wrapped in story. Maybe you'll have more symbols and stories around you than you thought. Until we tell again.